already said this is the 2.0 version of our presentation and I'm just going to give a brief recap for anyone who wasn't here on the 14th and a, just a little refresher for um, anyone who was here. What I um, wanted to first mention was we talked last week, but I never specifically mentioned the two frameworks that I use. And these are the, the basis of, of the material that I'm sharing with you today and the content along with some of my own perspectives and experiences. But um, the conversations framework specifically that we're drawing from today is from the book Conversations Worth Having. There's also a strategic component and that's helping to create strategy that inspires innovation and engagement. I don't know if any of you have ever been in a situation where you felt like, wow, this strategy would really benefit from more creative thinking and from people being more committed to the outcome. Well, guess what? We've got a framework for that. And it is based in part on a very simple truth that people commit to what they help create. So just like conversations worth having, we've got this appreciative inquiry underpinning to it that helps to bring out the best of what is. But unlike a lot of other strategic frameworks, what it does is it helps to bring people at every level of the organization into the conversation. And so um, if you'd like to learn anything more about either one of these, I'm happy to talk to you about that. In our, in our last episode, it, it kind of feels like the old soap opera, you know, uh, last week on, on Dark and Stormy, we talked about what emotions do you feel about when you're below the line? We had shown a quick video that simply illustrated that when we perceive threat, we tend to look at life in what they're calling a very below the line way, where um, what we are perceiving is influencing how we act, how we behave, and what we think about. And of course, the opposite of that was being above the line where we can be more creative and open-minded and when we listen better, even playful. So we talked about that in, in this last, um, in the last session. And what's important about this is to remember what, well, why is this important to networking? Because we don't want anything that we perceive to be a threat to stand in our way of success even in networking. And that might not seem readily apparent to everyone, that connection. So hold on and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more. Because we know that when we're feeling below the line, when we are feeling or perceive a threat, that it's harder then to build relationships and surface new ideas and become more genuinely engaged in our networking, right? It's harder to create that type of connection. And as Lori alluded to earlier, we really do want to go beyond the basics, right? We're at a point now, and I, uh, my analogy for this is similar to education for so long prior to all of the technology we had and access to information, we had to really memorize facts, right? That were static and from a few sources. And then the internet came along and there was so much information it's now becoming more important to just know where to access the information and how to validate that information than it is to have the answer or to memorize a fact. And I think the same could be said about our networking, right? When we first start networking before all of the technology, this is how I've seen it evolve, is of course we had to start with those basic questions. Who are you? What do you do? Where do you do it? You know, like those were the things that we needed to know because we really didn't have a lot of access to people like LinkedIn, right? We couldn't learn about people in any other way. But today, our networking conversations are really starting to evolve to something broader, something deeper, where we can start to create connections around our shared values, around something that is very forward thinking that may affect a certain industry or maybe all of us, where we can start to shape movements. And we heard almost all of these in your um, introductions and how we can make a contribution. So we want to really get to that level of connection. And to do that, we really want to um, be as above the line as we can possibly be. And one of the questions that came up in the last, after the last session, when we were talking about above the line and below the line, when we were talking about moving our brains from that, you know, protective me mode to the connection mode was 
why do we stay there, right? Why do we spend so much time thinking about the negative? Why do we remember those negative experiences more than we remember the positive? And for that, I found the wheel of emotions. And the wheel of emotions is something that was the work of um, Dr. Robert Plutchek in 2016, I think, maybe, no, 2005. And basically what he said is that people's emotions tend to range in about these, I believe it's eight areas, seven areas, seven areas. I think of it like a pizza, right? And what I noticed about all of this is that it looks like, depending on your appetite, one generous slice or one and a half slices of what we feel as humans are positive emotions. And I just want to let that sink in for a moment because I think that is why we tend to remember those negative experiences. I think it is why we are below the line where we're able to, you know, slip below the line more often than we are even aware of sometimes because there's simply more negative emotions to be felt. And so I wanted to just um, zoom in on these emotions a little bit more. So here's your pizza slice. And what I would tell you is whatever you can do, whatever you can feel that would inspire these emotions, hold on to them. Because as we've illustrated, right, there, there are many more negative emotions that can bring you down the line, but these are the emotions that are really going to bring you up above the line. The reason why that is important, the negative emotions have one thing in common. They're really engineered to help us survive. And that brings us to fear. So I would assume, and I can't see you all now, so but um, if you can do some shout outs for me, I assume most people are familiar with fight and flight as a fear response. Would that be accurate? Just shout out. Yes. Okay. Right. Yes. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Perfect. Is anyone familiar with the, the freeze aspect? No. Yes. Okay. You're in the headlights. Cool. Yes. Appease. Appease is also known as fawning. And I'm, what you don't know about me is that I'm a huge lover of alliteration. But in this case, I really do like the, uh, the rhyming. So I go with fight, flight, freeze, or appease. And a piece, I have to be honest with you, was new to me. Has anyone heard of this as part of the fear response? Okay, so I would think, and you can tell me, but I think it is very unlikely that we would perceive networking as a threat to our survival. So I'm not really going to focus on fight or flight, but I think the more subtle, the more kind of like next step thought around this is that Sometimes we perceive threats to what comes next, which is our thriving. Because in order to thrive, we must first survive. So we're already hardwired with some things that will keep us aware of what's going on, potential threats to our survival. The next level of threat is threats to what we perceive will stop us from thriving or the extent to which we survive. And that's where freeze and appease come in. So freeze can actually be very helpful. Um, because it gives us time to evaluate the situation. It makes us more, less noticeable. And early on, we also focus on escape routes. So um, again, I just transported myself to a, a very large networking room where you know you kind of are looking around and going, now where's the doors, where's the, you know, where's the restroom? You kind of are looking for that escape route because what if this group isn't the right group for me, right? And then what happens is that over time in the freeze response, what you start to learn is that um, becoming rather unresponsive might be helpful in making us feel less bad if we can't escape. So that's kind of the practical application of it in terms of networking. Later on, if you stay in this freeze mode, um, not, you start to get into this dissociation where you start to have these out of body experiences and maybe some of this might feel familiar to you where you're in a networking situation and you think, I wish I was anywhere but here. Or your emotions become numb. I don't even care if they don't wanna to talk to me, right? This is our internal dialogue. Or you have this unable to move, right? 
So that's the person who says, you know, I'm just going to go get my crudite. I'm going to go stand at this high top table and I'm going to hope no one recognizes me and comes over and talks to me. So that's how the freeze, um, the freeze response impacts what we do when we're networking. Appease is the next one. And again, if, if you hear it as spawn, that's okay. Appease is that when the threat is people, that we give them what we want. We placate them or we even submit to them in some ways because we want to bring down that threat. So how does that apply to networking? Well, for me, it's the person who comes up to you, you know, you kind of have um, a, a plan for your networking that what you're going to go into and there's someone who comes up to you and just won't let you away from the conversation. And you keep thinking, okay, I'm just going to talk with this person for five more minutes and then I'm going to move on. And then it ends up being almost the entire time. And before you know it, the event is over and you're driving home or you're walking out the door and someone else tells you, oh my goodness, this was so great. I met so many wonderful people. And you're already starting to kind of feel that regret or you're driving home in the car and you realize that you might have missed an opportunity that you just really were hoping for, but you felt like you really needed to appease. So those, I wanted to spend some time on that because I really feel like those were the questions that came up. And I hope, and I wanna stop here for a second to ask you all, does that start to address why maybe we might hold on to those negative experiences a little bit more? I, I think sometimes it's also habit. Um, I know mm -hmm. I used to be in retailing and, and you'd go up to people and say, may I help you? And we just say no without even thinking about it because there's right. this fear of, or not that just this routine behavior of, now this person's not gonna leave me alone till I actually buy something. I don't know what I'm looking for. So I think sometimes when we get involved in conversations, we, we think we know the ending before we get there. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and as leaders, I believe that we feel today, you know, we're expected to have all the answers. That's what we were taught, right? In a command and control type of hierarchy, it is about having all of the answers. Has anyone had one of these experiences in networking? We're like looking back on it now where you think, oh, wow, I didn't realize I was in, in fear response mode. Well, is the idea knowing that these are the sort of four stages or four potential stages that then you'd be able to deal with it better? Is that where you're headed? I'm hoping because- That's definitely right. Ha having the awareness is crucial, Morris, right? So, um, and what struck me when I first encountered the wheel of emotions was like, I didn't think of doubt or skepticism as something that would indicate a fear response. And typically you think of it as fight or flight. And as I learned a couple of years ago about freeze and appease, and I realized, oh, just like that wheel of emotions was so exquisitely splintered into specific feelings, there are so many phases of freeze and appease that we might not be aware of. So of the first point is really, yes, be aware of it. Like, oh, do I feel a little below the line? And we said in our last conversation, when you feel bad, then um, you're probably below the line. But we're also, after the awareness, we need a tool, right? So it's great that we're, we know we're, where we are, but how can we change the, change the shift? How can we signal to our brain and to the people that we're talking to, like, it's okay, we're safe. Now let's get to the good conversations. Because it would seem like in networking as in most of life, fight or flight is really not, those are not really the options. Right. I mean, and so the freeze and appease fun. seem like, you know, that's what we do instead is, hey, there's a strange situation. Let me figure out how to fit in. Let me appease. <laughs> and so then maybe you're not being yourself and all the other things that you're talking about. Absolutely. Sense. Absolutely. And a piece too can be, you know, over committing to things, you know, in, in terms, it's not just the conversation, but it could be, you know, saying, okay, I'll do that. I'll do that. And then before you know it, you realize, wow, I'm swamped with all of these things, you know, because I just, I was below the line. Yeah, I perceived it. I felt like this is something I need to do in order to survive. And I think that's the other thing. Just that's why I didn't spend any time on fight or flight, because I think that unlikely, 
I certainly hope not, but unlikely you're going to encounter a situation where you really will be compelled to an altercation with someone or that you will literally run out of the room. Um, but it is more likely that you're going to have this freeze or refuse response. And I think just knowing the subtleties of that is really important when we think about how can we move past those. Any questions here on any of this? The wheel of emotions? Please, somebody talk to me about the wheel of emotions. Because when I saw that there are several versions of that, and when I saw there's one that actually includes love, which I didn't include on this one because we're talking about um, business networking, but there is a slice on the wheel that, um, let me just go back to that for a second. There is a slice on the wheel that has loving right here. Um, but when I looked at these, they almost all work out the same way. So different variations that people have adapted this content from the research. But when you see the images of the wheels, it took me a while. And then it's all of a sudden went, oh, geez, no wonder. And this is the headline for what I'm passionate about. No wonder we need to shift the tone and directions of most of our conversations, because most of them are going to end up in this kind of negative side of the wheel. And that's really limiting. And that's what I'm hoping that, you know, with the awareness and what we're going to do next, which is all kind of going to be on you guys. We're going to practice it a little bit together, but I've got, I really would like you all to start designing some of these questions that will not only help yourself have a better connection with people, but also to let others kind of, you know, let them know it's okay. You're safe. We want to work together. We want to get to the good stuff of working together. I would call this wheel of emotion rather depressing in that yeah. it's this tiny slice that's anything positive and right. this huge slice that's negative. Um, right. I think somebody, somehow there must be some emotion in the, of those seven in between there other than happy and, and whatever surprised right. that would be positive right. that we're capable of. Why, do, right. why does it have to be over 70% negative? Right. Uh, well, come on. Excellent question, right? I have a couple theories, Mars. We'll talk about them offline. But, you know, it, it goes into the, the fear response is what triggers people to act. And that's been so pervasive, whether that's act to buy, act to join, act now to like or comment online. So it's, there's been so much emphasis on the wrong syllable. There's been so much that's been created around tap into that primal fear of, you know, what am I missing out on FOMO, right? Fear of missing out that this is what we've been conditioned for. So I see, yes, could be depressing. I see opportunity because I'm like, we can expand that wheel. And, and that's part of what gets me so excited about what I do is because the more we can shift the tone and direction of our conversations, we may not find new emotions there, but boy, aren't we going to amplify that piece. It's going to look like you're going to have one deep dish slice versus one thin crust, you know, a seven and a half thin crust slices, right? It's going to be completely different. So that's what um, gets me excited about that. And it's part of what we do on the show. And Amy knows this. We, we take that business challenge, which we know is making a business leader or the people, you know, who are tasked with implementing the strategy, they're somewhere over here in the seven slices because it's a threat. But we want to get them over here into this more purpose-driven um, slice where, where we are courageous and inquisitive and free to, to try, free to experiment, the liberty to try. That, these are powerful emotions. And for anyone who wasn't on the last session, we talked about the whole physiological response that ensues once you have these emotions. And trust me, if you weren't here, you want to stay on the positive side of things. You'll just accomplish much more. Anybody else on the wheel of emotions? Has any, Janine, yes. Yeah, I, um, I, I mean, I, I agree with Morris. It's, it's, it's depressing <laughs> to realize that we are hardwired this way. But on, on the flip side, I think seeing this and understanding it better is actually really really helpful because that means that when you when you get into one of these you know freeze appease you being able to recognize it and realizing Hi, i'm hardwired to do this okay like i mean it's because for me if i get into that place you know i know oh, no, with me you know i immediately get sort of caught up and 
oh yeah, I'm just not very good at this or oh, I've got it, you know, and it just to, to right. know, recognize it and just that sort of takes all that away, I guess is what I'm saying. It's like, all right, I'm human, I'm hardwired to be worried about something and, you know, sort of get off it and move towards focusing on the positive and just... Um, Absolutely. You know, and realizing that probably everybody else in the room is hardwired the same way, unless they're more Neanderthal than human. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. Well, and so Janine wrote, wrote two great things. One is it is it's hardwired and conditioned, right? So it's both. We're fighting that and we're fighting generations of that because the fear response in and of itself is a very limited purpose. It's just supposed to get you to survive. The thriving part is where all the good stuff is, right? So that's what we want to move toward. And even when you said, you know, like, um, oh, now it just went from me, but you, you said something that indicated the way you said it, I was like, oh, I immediately imagined myself freezing in, in space. Like, well, I don't know that yet. Aha, yet, right, Lori? I don't know that yet. So the, the reaction is I'm just going to stand still. And, and hope no one notices that I don't know that yet, or you know maybe this situation will just end. And so it's, it's great awareness, whether it's learning to use, uh, build a web design and build and launch a website, or whether that is networking, right? You know, the, the freeze will give you that moment to look around and say, is it good for me? Am I okay? Um, but then you have to quickly move from those kind of below the line feelings to above the line. And that's what we're going to work on next. Good question. Else? Yes, yes, Margaret. Margaret. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, Margaret, go ahead. Oh, uh, uh, just a quick comment. As I look at those words, um, the positive emotions, I mean, the words in the center, happy is, um, well, well I'm, when I look at the negative words, to me, they have more emotion in them yes. than happy. Uh, and to me, it, it just helps me to frame, okay, what am I feeling? Okay, I'm angry, but to communicate with someone and say, I'm really annoyed, is probably not as emotionally packed. And that might be a way to move above, to get above the line by communicating. I'm really annoyed rather than, than I'm angry. Um, exactly. Yeah. So, and it's a good question to ask yourself, right? You know, what am I really feeling? And in the conversations worth having framework, you know, a question, let's say this is happening between two of you, one of the examples I use, because I think a lot of people can relate to it, right? So you're in the kitchen and your person that you live with just kind of lashes out at you on the way you're putting, loading the dishwasher. Interesting, right? And so a great question to ask is, I really want to understand why, why you're upset. Can you tell me specifically about what I'm doing that's upsetting you? So that genu it, it indicates a genuine interest in learning, but it also surfaces some new ideas because it gives the person who just kind of lashed out at you, it gives the person that, that pause, breathe get, breathe, get curious, which we talked about last time to say, Am I really, is that what I'm really upset about? right? Mm. Or is it because I just had this terrible day at work and I haven't told anybody yet? Or is it really like, yeah, I've been holding this in passive aggressively for the last 15 years and you need to know today. All of that is a good conversation to have afterwards, right? But it gives that person that, that question, gives that person time to just do that kind of visual check of, yeah, what am I upset? Is this really about the way that the top rack is being loaded? Maybe, maybe not, right? We won't know until we ask. So Kelly, I just wanted to ask, do you think, you know, as everybody is trapped at home because of the pandemic, is, is that shifting the, either the percentage or the depth of people's emotions? Are they more negative because of all the things right. associated with lack of mobility, lack of interaction with other people, et cetera? So I think it's um, on a very individual basis and, um, but I would say just given what we're looking at here, right, the chances are that if we are not having high quality conversations with one another, then the chances are more of us could, could be over on those seven slices of negative emotions. And that's part of the networking. And you're going to see this when we get into the questions, you know, like we, we want to bond with one another as humans. And, and the research indicates 
just biologically because of the function of the um, men being the hunters and women being the gatherers, that when the chips are down, women tend to, well, they literally tend and befriend. That's the research, right? We're going to gather together. We're going to bolster one another because that's how we can help us, our little group here, survive. The men are, will, were traditionally out bringing in the food sources, looking to see where's, where are the other threats. So there were just two different roles. Um, but again, this is in no way, shape, or form to um, understate the real trauma that people are experiencing right now. But just in the, con in the context of having of your question, you have people working from home, I think it just highlights even more the need to have a conversation that really is focusing on the best of what is and helping people in that dialogue find ways to build on that which is not to say you shouldn't check in with somebody and say, how, how are you doing, right? Because that's, that's a different conversation. I'm not a psychologist, but you know, I know from this aspect of it, going, you know, talking to somebody and going, oh, it's really tough, isn't it, right? Like that's a tend and befriend tendency that we have, but is that something that will help move yourself and this person forward or above the line, however you like to think about it? Good, everyone. So are you now, did I sufficiently give you enough time to warm up for asking, practicing generative questions? Because now you all have the awareness. Now you know there's a slice and a half or one generous slice of positive emotions out there just waiting for you and the people you want to share it with. So how do we get there? And this is pretty much where we left off. And the last one, we started to talk about generative questions. The term most people aren't familiar with, so I'd like to just say there are questions that generate possibilities. They, they change the way people think the moment the question is asked. What are you working on? Lori asked that. So tell us about something exciting that you're working on. Aha, exciting. I have a completely different visual image in my head. And they simulate the images upon which people can act. Join me about this. Recall a time when something went well for you. Oh, Yes, I remember before I worked from home and this is what I did and it really got me through that time, right? So these are the things that will bring people forward. The first question that I had used was this um, statement that you could make in networking. So you meet someone for the first time and, and Pam was in, the, um, in our group session then. And I put this out to Pam and I said, Pam, that's a really beautiful necklace, right? Like that's a very respectable thing to say in networking. Unfortunately, it doesn't help to create more connection or it doesn't um, surface any new information that would help you continue a conversation. So I changed, I, I, I made the statement and then I added the generative question. Is there a story behind it? And because my good friend Lori was monitoring the chat, I didn't see this right away. But it turned out, Pam responded, well, yes, it has 10 stones. My husband gave it to us, to me for our 10-year anniversary, representing each year. And when I found that later, I was like, well, well, first of all, look at me, right? I'm already smiling. I feel lighter because now I've got something else to talk to Pam about. I feel closer to her, right? I've actually been married for 10 years twice. So <laughs> that's a different conversation. But I've got something to talk to her about. And so that, that was my kind of introduction to um, generative questions. So I'm just gonna hide this panel for one second here while you all warm up because here's what we're going to do now. And I am just going to even, um, I think I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. Are you all seeing me again? Lovely, lovely. Okay, so I actually put together some exercises for you. When we go to network, right? When, when you're thinking about, I'm going to get up early, I'm going to be you know, video camera ready by 7.30 in the morning to join this group of people, some of whom I know and some of who I don't, what are you thinking? And this is not a right or wrong answer. Just kind of tell me some of the things that might be going, a statement you might be making to yourself or what you're thinking. Please. And, and if you really want, you can make it up or you can say, oh, my friend told me once that he or she felt this way. I know for me, um, 
one of the things, and this is different than in-person networking, but often for me, it's what am I going to, I'm going to learn something today. Right. I'm going to learn something new today. Awesome. Awesome. Which I just awesome. did. Generative question. <laughs> and I'm going to come back to you on that, Amy. So awesome. Thank you. Anybody else who, who may feel um, something different? Yeah, I'll, I'll go. Um, sure. I actually, the first thing I think is, okay, what is the checklist of the 25 things that I had to do um, to be not only prepared to get on the call um, so I won't be interrupted? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so that I'm, I'm able to contribute and to gain uh, from that. Right. Perfect. So you've got something else going on, right? And this perceived threat of, I've got to do all these other things before I get to the networking. Perfect. Anyone else? For me, it depends on, on what kind of networking. In this environment where it's people that I know at least some of, I get very excited. What am I going to learn new? Who am I going to meet? Where am I going to connect? Uh, when I go to a big, bigger social event where I don't know people, I'm the one hiding behind the plant in the corner, which surprises a lot of people because I tend to be very extroverted. Um, but I get very, very intimidated that everybody else has done things that are much greater than I have done. And that there's right. going to be this neon sign that goes off saying, I'm a loser. I haven't fulfilled all of my dreams yet. Mm -hmm. And so um, I don't want anybody to know that I'm an imposter, that I, I don't deserve to be here. I just kind of got stuck here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else have one? Okay, well, I'm going to build on Lori's and, and a couple of these, and let's see what we can do with this. Um, I'm an emotional empath, so while I also am very extroverted, I am also many times the person with the crudité, and this is why I use that example, at the high top table, and my, my back is to the wall so that I have a full view of what's going on, because I oftentimes pick up the energy in the room. And if the energy is good in the room, like this, I'm thrilled. If the energy, I'm unsure of it, then I start to perceive that, you know, like, oh, what's going on here? I'm not really sure. Is this a threat? Is this the right room for me? Um, and that might kind of dovetail into what Lori's saying, too. Should I be here, right? So how do we get out of that? Amy, Lori, um, I think you, you touched on, on both of this with Here's a great question. So I'm going to model one and then I want the rest of you to kind of shout out some other questions you might ask yourself. So if you're just thinking like, I don't have anything to share or I don't know that I'm um, able to be in the room today, Barbara, right? For all these other things that I've got going on in my head. A great first question you can ask to prime yourself to get into a better place is, why do I want to give it my best effort today? Just stop yourself right there. I, I got up, I set my alarm early, I got my cup of coffee. <laughs> I'm, I'm making sure my, you know, I can get my computer on. Why do I wanna give it my best effort today? So that's an example of one type of question that you could um, ask of yourself to prime yourself for a more meaningful and productive conversation. These generative questions, remember, these are questions that you do not necessarily have the answer to. Now, when it's yourself, even you might not, you might think I know why, why I'm doing this and what I'm doing, but not necessarily. And I started off with the example of do as I say, not what I do, because generally speaking, generative questions do not start with why. And yet I asked, <laughs> why do I want to give it my best effort? But we're looking for a what question, a how, a statement can be, tell me about a time when, because that is kind of a question. Um, so I'm gonna give you one that was already discussed. What do I wanna learn about from the people I'm going to meet, be meeting, or what do I wanna learn from them? And now I'm turning it over to this group. You're coming into this networking thinking, I don't have anything to share. So what's a generative question you could ask yourself to help move you out of that fear response, the freeze or the peas, and into something where you feel excited, 
dare I say, happy. <laughs> You're in your pizza slice. You feel happy about coming to this conversation. We'll give it a couple minutes. We could break into rooms if you want. I have that's more comfortable. Can you, can you say again? I was <laughs> just say again. I was I was writing notes on what you were saying, and then I realized I didn't hear what I was supposed to do. No, thank you. Thank you for asking me to repeat it. So the scenario is you are getting ready to go to a networking event, right? And you're thinking for whatever reason, you know, you've got that checklist running through your head or maybe you just, you're not sure is this the right group? I really don't feel like I have anything to share. You don't feel it. You know what I mean? Right. We've, I think we've all been there. Maybe it's coming at the end of the day or, you know, maybe it's a part of a conference and you're just like, I don't have anything to share. So what are some questions that you could ask yourself to get from below the line, above the line, to get into the good deep dish, <laughs> one slice of pizza in the pie, mm -hmm. to get from thinking about yourself, me, that protect mode, that connect mode. And the examples I gave were, you know, why do I want to give it my best effort? Or even walk in the door. Why, why do I want to do this? Your, your brain, the prefrontal cortex side, will, will give you that answer because there's a reason why you signed up, right? There's a reason why you're going. And then what do I want to learn either about people or what do I want to learn from them when I'm talking? Mm -hmm. well, and this is you... like, this is a full on shout out. There's no right or wrong because you haven't learned them yet. Aren't, aren't you kind of saying, Hey, what's your goal for being there? Is that what you're asking? Nope because the goal for being there is more of an analytical thought. And then the analysis, your, your brain will start to say, well, is that the right goal? Well, what if I don't meet that many people? Or what if I'm unable to make that connection? So then the, the, the perception of the threat starts to come in. This is just saying, what, what is the best that could happen from this networking situation? Kelly, does it have to start with what? Because I, I go into a lot of these with the thought of, you know, who am I going to meet today that I want to connect with after the webinar? Right. Um, because there was there, I either perceived a connection or I thought there was something really interesting. Like I would like to follow up with Howard because I really um, uh, got excited with hearing him tell his story and talking about turnarounds and change and so forth. And I just have to say, Kelly, that I don't know if it's just me, but you look like Diane Keaton. And so I just keep <laughs> staring at your face. Is it only me? No, she does. You're right. She looks like Diane okay. Keaton. Thank you. It's a little distracting. Well, I keep thinking of all the movies you've been in. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm not wearing my hat, but you know, I do love to wear pants. <laughs> I seldom wear a dress. So maybe we're onto something there. <laughs> you have a Halloween costume for life. I do. I love this. I love it. April Fool's Day. Maybe I'll come in and fool Diane Keaton. Well, Barbara, though, you touched on something that could be a question, right? And here's the, the statement works, but the question you're going to engage in a little dialogue with yourself, right? So you said you got really excited to hear what Howard talked about. Why, why not ask yourself, what's the potential that I could get really excited about talking to somebody today, and it was a complete surprise to me. And Mars, that goes back to the goal question. If it's the goals, you're limiting, like, I want to talk to people for this specific reason, because it's tied to this goal, as opposed to, I may just engage in a conversation with somebody, it seems serendipitous, right? But I'm going to learn something that is really going to excite me, and I couldn't have thought about that before I got into the room if I'm thinking about goals and like a, a strategic plan. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't just in the context of having these more meaningful, productive conversations. Of course, when you decide what networking you're going to, that's part of a larger plan, right? I'm going to join this group and that group. I'm going to go to this event, right? So that's there, but it doesn't drive the thinking of the conversation that you're having with yourself before you go into the room. Barbara, does that work for you? asking that type of question, like just formalizing it in your head and saying, I wonder, because they're right, it, you're having a conversation, I wonder what 
who am I going to meet that's just going to give me some type of really ex surprising conversation and I'm going to be really excited about it because what you've just done is prime your brain for that, right? And then there's another part of appreciative inquiry that is the anticipatory principle. And it says, as many of us know in other ways, that what we anticipate will happen, happens. What we happens. anticipate that we'll see, we see. So mm -hmm. what you anticipate is you're going to meet somebody who's really interested, got this really cool story to tell you. And well, guess what? You're going to end up hearing that story in that room if there's one to be had. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Uh, sure. Barbara, uh, this is Howard. I just sent you via the chat room my uh, email address. Great. Thank you. <laughs> and Howard, our, our homes look suspiciously um, familiar. I thought you were standing downstairs in my family room. I was like, how did Howard get here? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you're Kelly, you're seeing what you want to see. That's right. <laughs> maybe, maybe you really Shame. asked me to come right over. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, okay. So here, here again, you're going into the room. I really don't feel like I have anything to share. What are some questions that you could ask yourself to, to prime that brain, to get it feeling playful and inquisitive and confident and all of those other happy emotions? Well, I think Kelly, to your above the line and below the line is um, to maybe change the mindset I go in with, you know, what can I share that will be helpful to someone else that I don't know yet what they're doing as opposed to what's missing, what, what do I bring? So that right. it, it takes it from the negative to the positive of being defeatist before I even get there. And you already did this in our session today. And so I want to show that because this is something that of course we rely on people like Laurie who have these fabulous facilitation, bring people togetherness tools, right? Because that's very genuine. Why wouldn't you ask yourself? What's my proudest achievement over the last year or two? Something that I'll like to share because chances are I'm going to be called on to talk or make an introduction, right? So it's great that Lori asked us that when we like, what are you excited about working on? But why don't you ask yourself that? You know, maybe you're getting ready. It's, you're in the mirror, you're driving over or you're rushing around. <laughs> it's, it's building Barbara that extra, maybe 30 seconds, um, you know, just to say, I'm going to just sit, pause, breathe, and just get a little curious, you know, what is my proudest accomplishment over the last year or two? Because guess what? There is one. There's probably more than one. And there's going to be one that you just feel compelled to share with this group. I've asked people, um, and it kind of goes back to Lori, uh, which is, what is one of the best things that's happened during this pandemic? Yes. So again, with it's one thing that we all have in common right now, no matter what we're doing on Zoom, which is, you know, so it, it is that shift, but it's something that, um, to your point, it's an achievement. Yes. So it was something that was unexpected and everything else. And it is something that, you know, okay, that has been a wonderful thing that has happened. You know? Absolutely. And, and you can I think of it either in personal or in business as well. And I want to freeze there for a second. Thank you so much, Amy. And I want to ask everyone else, when Amy asked that, when she said, what's the positive thing that happened in the pandemic? Who immediately had a picture in their mind's eye of something positive that happened? Just raise your hand. Right. Yep. Anybody want to shout one out? I'm going to shout one out. Like family, I never knew you could cook so many days in a row. And my cooking's gotten better because of it, right? Now my husband's an excellent cook. And, but even we had my stepson quarantining with us for a while. My daughter lives here. They were making food. We did like uh, chopped meats iron chef. We had these cooking competitions one week, you know, because we just got creative with it. So that's mine. Shout out. Tell me something positive that happened during this pandemic for you. We did Zoom family meetings. Love it. Margaret, right. same with me. Yes. Yep, every week. Yep. We actually did Zoom game nights, you know, with people all over the country. I love that. We play competitive Parcheesi here. Um, anyone else who had their hand raised? I, well, so I thought of something more globally. I am um, fascinated at how 
quickly we stopped using fossil fuels and the and the air cleaned up and the iron you know the animals came out and you know you could see from satellites the difference i thought that was really really cool yes could not agree more right it's, it's no longer a hypothetical question yeah I've taken advantage of all of the free uh, webinars online to gain certification points toward my SHRM certification that recertifies next year. Awesome. That's and, great. And I think a lot of groups are, are doing more webinars. Um, I had something similar in that uh, National Geographic did a three part uh, series on walking through India. And it's, you know, it's like, wow. And I, and I also went to Africa for, for an hour. Uh, it's great, clean bathrooms, no crowds, you know, and not the, the heavy fees. Um, it, was, it was wonderful. Isn't that a fun way to connect with people? What did you do during the pandemic? Well, I went to India and Africa, right? Like now, you, now you've got their attention, right? They're, they're gonna learn something about you they didn't know before. <laughs> That's awesome. And so, when you're in a group like this, then um, I'll, I'll change the question up a little bit. When you're in a group, it's rather intimate. Some of you already know one another. This is a small group like this, as opposed to the big, you know, 500 person reception at a conference or something that you might be going to. Um, then I, what question could you ask? Because of course I want to give you the answer because I want to help you all so much. But you know, what question would you ask yourself to prime your brain for here are my peeps, right? Here are people I know and love professionally and um, how am I going to relate to them today, right? Like maybe I feel like, hmm, I, I know what they do, right? Like I know it all, not in terms of I know it all, but like I know them and I don't think I have any questions to ask. How could you kind of reframe that in your brain um, and ask yourself, ask yourself a question that might get you better prepared to relate to others, to relate to others differently than you have before. I think, like, you know, some of the questions- um, How about, uh, what, what can I share about my- I missed the end of that. What can I share? Oh, what can I share about, um, myself uh, today with the group that would be interesting that they may not know. Exactly. Yep. And you could flip that also or extend that to what, what assumptions am I making about <laughs> what I think people do? So one of the things that I had uh, Charlie Timmons uh, did for me was a, a 360 and you had a list of questions that you could pick for people to answer and one of them was you know what kind of appliance would I be and and um, it was it was very I think informative for where other people are coming from you know because right. it was you know uh, clearly anonymous I'm like okay somebody thought I was a blender somebody thought I was a food processor and, and trying to say Where's that coming from? What, what is it about me that right. you know, resonated? Um, the other question was, you know, what kind of dog? And, right. and again, it's like, where, where are people putting their emphasis, you know? And it was, it was extremely interesting. Whether or not somebody else would get something out of it, I don't know, but, but it was for me. Right, so if you could apply that to others, right? This, what I hear in that is you had some new insight about yourself. So how could you get some new insight into other people? What questions might you ask about that? And I think that's where the assumptions come in. I think it's easy to say, oh, I know what Amy does, right? CFO, accounting. Do I, do I have any idea what's going on in Amy's world right now? As we see, not only, you know, we've got the pandemic and lockdown, but we've got so many other issues. And what's going on in Amy's world? What's different about Amy's professional world today that I just made some assumption, I know what she does, and um, how can I learn about that from her? What would be a question that 
because you, you are a group that have worked together, you do kind of know <clears throat> some of what you do, then do two of you want to kind of role play this a little bit? Somebody say, this is what I do. And someone else ask a, a new and different type of a question around what you think you know about what, what that person does. It's only getting later in the day, not earlier. Everyone should be coming more wide awake. Howard's trying to talk and you're on mute. Oh, Howard. Excellent. Thank you, Amy. I didn't see that. Howard, do you want to unmute? Did you have I'm something? I'm not sure if he's talking to us or if he got a phone call. Okay. Howard, are you talking to us? Because you're on mute. Oh, okay. He looks like he's listening. I don't know what happened to him. So, so Amy, can you tell me something about what a CFO does that people would be surprised to learn about? You're on mute. No, I'm on mute. <laughs> Say that again, please. Sure. Uh, what can you share with me about what you do as a CFO that would be a surprise to me, um, you know, as, as an HR person, I see CFOs is not giving me the money I need to take care of the people that I want to take care of. So tell me, what, what don't I understand or what, what do you do that I would be really surprised about? I am the person who keeps you out of jail and also your cheerleader. I love that. Now you've got the, go ahead, Lori. I was going to say, um, can you tell me more how you're my cheerleader? <laughs> when, when I think I asked for money and you go, no, no, no. That's a, that's a great example, right? You know, because now <clears throat> Lori in her asking that question and Amy's incredibly fun response. So thank you for that, right? Visual images. I keep you out of jail. Oh, okay. And I'm your cheerleader, right? So the, the uh, disconnect between those things uh, make it very humorous. And now Lori's got something, she's got a visual image to go on that's going to, it's already challenged her assumption because she thought maybe she knew what you did and now she had learned this new thing. Maybe she thought you knew you kept people out of jail, but wait, how are you a cheerleader? So the asking a question like that is, is going to, again, it shifts the tone and direction of your conversations and you have to be able to prime your own brain to say, how can I challenge these assumptions about people? And this, you know, it is a little bit of work, whether it's the five minutes before we start here or when we can get back into person, you're driving over. You have to just kind of think about these questions. What is stimulating you intellectually around this or what are you naturally curious about? And I think of, uh, the other shoe on that foot is, am I ready to listen? because asking the great questions is one part of it. And I do hope you all have me back for Deep Listening with Kelly Stewart. But um, doing that act of listening is really important. And how can you get your brain ready to listen? Well, clearly, if you are feeling negative emotions, it's going to be much harder for you to get into deep listening. So there's the headline, but of course there's more to it than that. And so how do you get into that frame of mind? Am I ready to listen? And I will tell you, it is easier when you make this type of connection with people. When they've caught, it's the novelty. As humans, we are very novelty seeking people in some ways, um, especially in this culture where we came over and said, oh, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna make this happen. We're gonna do this whole brand new form of government, right? So there's a novelty seekingness to us that says, we want to be surprised and delighted. Oh, a happy emotion, right? Two happy emotions. So anytime that we can activate that within ourselves, we're going to be better able to listen as well. Another uh, couple of questions, if you want to just take some of these down as notes, because I want to move into the next part, which is what questions do we ask of others, right? And we're, we're starting to shift there. But if you are thinking, I don't really have enough to share. I'm not sure I'm prepared for this networking. Here are some questions you can ask yourself around what's my bigger why? <clears throat> why am I here? My purpose. What do I value? In our everyday rush, we sometimes forget to pause 
breathe and get curious, which was a big part of our first session on the 14th around what do I value? Like, what do I value about this group? As, and, and is it different? Amy, uh, you mentioned Rotary, right? Is this group different from Rotary? Are there different things? So what do you value about this connection that you're going to be making? Uh, what am I thinking about when I think about the future? Well, there's an interesting question to ask yourself. Per chance, I can tell from this group already, some great conversations are going to come from that because if the conversation lulls, which of course it never will any longer for you, but if the conversation lulls, this is something that you can you know, uh, bring up as a topic. There's a lot to talk about in the future. Uh, what movements, this one's just too easy. What movements am I excited to shape? And this goes back to the connections that we want to create with people. These are the shared values, right? This is the forward thinking thought. This is the, the way we contribute. And this is a group that has a lot of ways that they want to contribute. And in what new or different ways do I want to contribute to your talents? because it's beacon, it's networking for life, right? So, you know, uh, Amy, you're, you're up on my screen here, so I'm gonna pick on you again, right, Amy? How can I contribute to your talents? Is there something that I have that could help you do your work better? Or are there people that I know in my network that, you know, can, um, can help you and I can make those introductions? But again, reframing that question into how can I help you contribute? How can I contribute to your talent? an entirely different question than can I make a referral for you? Still a good question, but this one takes it to the next level. The last question I want you to ask, and this will come up no surprise to this group, is right before you walk in the door, I want you to ask yourself, how do I feel right now? Think about the wheel of emotions. Think about the wheel of emotions as a pizza. And just ask yourself, if, if these questions haven't gotten you there yet, what could I do right now to improve my emotions? And this is, would be funny if it weren't true, but there was a time when uh, I had a job and in my darkest days, which happened more frequently <laughs> than I care to remember, I would have to quick look at um, pictures of puppies up for adoption for rescue. Cause I just had to break the cycle of my own negative thoughts. And the quickest way I could think to do that was to go on like puppy finder or, you know, doc, the pet finder and just look and see. Now, I say sad but true because in the last 15 years, I've had seven dogs and we have three right now. So clearly this is not an ongoing, um, it, it's, it's not a sustainable initiative. So, <laughs> so, but there are things you can do, whether that's recalling a loved one, whether that is recalling your achievements from the last year, whether that is getting excited about something that's happening in the future. You can, in an instant, by asking yourself these types of questions and, and choosing to focus on something that makes you happy, because that's okay, people. <laughs> I know conventional wisdom will be like, no, you know, you're coming from this place of pain, right? And we're going to solve your pain. No, you can, you can choose to be happy and find the thing that makes you happy. And then, then go into that conversation. All right, part two. You're in the room, you're in the Zoom room, you're in the physical room, you're going to talk to other people. What is one of the first questions that you typically, prior to this, ask people? Shout it out. What do you do? Thank you, Amy. And I did not <laughs> prep Amy on that. What do you do? Well, we've already covered one question, right? Is what are you working on now that's exciting to you? So you that's, that's one question. I'm going to give you one more. Oh, yes, because Amy took my other one. I had three lined up for you. What are some surprisingly good changes or opportunities that have happened for you because of COVID? And professionally speaking, I know of a woman, she's a small business owner, and she had the opportunity to really, what we're calling, get her hands back in the clay with her business. And she is finding greater efficiency than she ever knew, not because people weren't doing their jobs well or, you know, effectively, but because there were a lot of holdover practices and um, processes that they were doing that because she has the 40 year history of the company, she was like, oh, we do not need to do those any longer. But the message had never trickled down to people, right? So it's really given her an opportunity to get her hands in the clay, work more one-on-one. -on -one. She has a small business, so she's able to work more one-on-one -on -one with people. And I'll tell you, this is going to set the whole 
you know, uh, the whole future for her company is changing because of that. Um, so the other, instead of just what do you do, right? You can ask what's your proudest achievement, your proudest, and, and say, you can say professional achievement. Some people like yours truly don't have a very clearly defined thing that they do, right? I teach conversation framework that doesn't really help people under immediately understand what I do. But if someone were to ask me, you know, what are you doing that's exciting? Well, I'm shifting the tone and direction of conversations through these, these boot camps that are research based, they're proven, they're based in appreciative inquiry. Oh, what's appreciative inquiry? Glad you asked, right? So we can get into those conversations that I wouldn't get into if I just said to someone, I um, facilitate strategic planning workshops and I teach boot camps. So what all now will you ask instead of what do you do? What other questions do you think you could ask someone? And I've got one, two, three, four, five. Is it fair to ask, uh, you know, how can I help you? Absolutely. Or that's kind of a, uh, you know. Absolutely. Know, seems sort of wussy or. <laughs> no, how can I help you write strategic alliances as we look at how businesses are changing and going into this, this next evolution, uh, the fourth industrial revolution, right? Where more technology and uh, more digital things are taking over. I think it would be very wise to start to brainstorm ideas on how might we pull our resources together? How might we redefine our services? And you can't get there if you don't start by asking, like, how might I help you? Like, how might we work this together? It's the beginning of the conversation with some additional context around it. I think another one, especially for Beacon, is who would you like to meet? Mm -hmm. Who would you like to meet? So that's a great, because it brings up this phrase um, that I use all the time. So who are the people essential to your success? Or most, most essential to your success? And thank you again, Laurie, because you rolled us right into another question, which is what's your target audience? And as you all are learning this, you will not be surprised to understand, I don't like that phrase, target audience. The visual image is adversarial. It, it indicates that there are people with whom have a literal target on their back, and I would like to dominate them. I would like to find them, shoot them, and dominate them in some way. And that, to me, does not get us off on a very good foot, right? Because that's the, the that takes us into the negative emotion range of the wheel of emotions. What I like to ask people is, who can you create the most value for? Who do you create the most value for in what you do and how you do it? Because you might meet three people who are digital marketers that night, but if you ask, who can you create the most value for in what you do and how you do it, you're going to get three entirely different explanations. So on that, so now we're not asking who's your target audience, right? We're asking who do you create the most value for? What else might we want to know if we were pausing, breathing, and getting curious about that? What they're doing, what else what might we ask that would surface some new information about them? What's your dream vision of what success looks like? Yep. Right? Because don't can't we all fix our own industries? Don't we all have the solution? Excellent. Could ask, um, what are you learning? And that might be <sighs> professional or personal. Yes. What are you learning? I love that question. And bonus, because it might also benefit you, right? <laughs> what are you learning? Oh, I didn't even know that technology exists. What? I've been doing it the, the, the slow way. This is great. Can you tell me more about it? I love that. And I think associated with that is what was most surprising, you know, just like, but just learning, but like, what, what took you by surprise? Like, oh, I didn't know, I didn't know anything about Nollywood. <laughs> oh. Right, right. What, what, what's been your wow, right? What, what, what wowed you this year? 
in the last couple of years. We don't have to just limit it to this past year, but we can talk about things prior to COVID. What gets you excited about the future? Mm -hmm. Right now we're being conditioned to not be excited about anything. So what gets you excited about the future? I have another question if you want to really understand what people are doing and, and you're asking and, and you want to deepen that conversation and they tell you, well, this is what I do. This is how I do it, you know, in, in unique and inspiring ways. How do you know you're succeeding? Because that is going to surface their case study, the, the client they want to tell you the most about, because that's when it really worked for them. And in that, you're going to get a much better idea of who their best client is because they're going to tell you a lot of details about that. Howard, that was a great story that you shared this morning, right? I mean, like that was it. Like I got a much better idea and it was a, a very compelling story, right? But, you know, just all of the, the detail that went into that, that's awesome. And as people, we don't generally, you know, kind of just like, oh yeah, let me whip out my case studies and start going over them with you. There, there's an invitation for that. Lori made the invitation for us to do that today. Right? So that's what you're doing. You're inviting people to share. And when you ask, how do you know you're succeeding? And I'm sure you all, I, will someone give me some, somebody tell me, answer that question for me, whoever wants to. Tell me how you're succeeding. I'm actually you know. going to talk about that because Morris last week, Morris and um, Mark Cassidy won professional services um, seminar and they talked about the lifetime Optimizing the Lifetime Customer Value, if I've got the title right. right. And it was specifically, how do you know you're succeeding with that client? Right. And different ways to do that. So mm -hmm. if any of you haven't, this is a plug for, for uh, I can't talk this morning, I don't have enough coffee. This is a plug for professional services and Morris and Mark, you know, go on to the website and look at that recording because they talked about how do you do that? How do you know you're succeeding and tangible right. ways to do that? And, and that will wrap it in because like you said, how do you know? Talk about one of those. Well, if you've done this exercise that Morris and Mark talked about, now you can talk about that. And yeah, with that case study, you just whip up because you already know it. Exactly. And we want to learn through other people's stories. So that's a great way. And if somebody pauses and says, boy, I need to give that more thought. You've just helped that person. You've helped them. And if you have a resource like Amy has, oh, you know what? I just was, you know, part of this, then that you're going to pass that along and you will have unintentionally stumbled on something that gets them really excited when they were doing their pre-talk and thinking, what, what do I want to learn today? Whoa, I wanted to learn about customer lifetime value, right? So you don't know what you will surface until you engage in the conversation. And that's part of the generative question. These are questions for which you do not already have the answer to. You're coming with the beginner's mind. So I hate to be rude and give it. Yes. Oh, answer. my goodness. Um, clearly, because we've had such tremendous dialogue, this was a good idea to have 2.0. Uh, we only have four minutes left out of, out of our two hours together this morning. And I, and I want to be very, very sympathetic and, and uh, appreciative and conscious of other people's commitments um, because I have the sneaking suspicion that we are an extremely shy group who has nothing to offer each other. <laughs> and that the reason we brought Kelly in was to give us hope that we can grow to this level of being able to have an active and engaged conversation. Um, I, I've, I've taken copious notes. And I'm going to be all over everybody's calendars with my new questions. Um, and, and I would love to have Kelly actually do a wrap up, but I don't know that we have time. So, um, you know, you do have her contact information. We'll make sure we get it out to you. Please, um, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very, very much for coming back for 2.0 or for those who didn't have a chance to be part of 1.0. Um, my pleasure. We, we, we really, really appreciate. Uh, and, and we don't have to wait till yet to take advantage of what you've shared with us today. Um, I think it's a, a great launch for, I realize I didn't say that this was Beacon's newest group, New Jersey South. <laughs> um, so, so thank you. Please do keep in touch with each other, reach out to each other, continue with this questioning. Beacon is the premier executive networking organization serving the Mid-Atlantic region. To learn more, go to beaconforlife.org.